That's okay. All right. Thank you all for coming along. Um, hopefully this will be reasonably enlightening and we can do a little bit of a, a live demo of some digital TV debugging. Part of this is uh, an open forum, so, you know, towards the end we can discuss some of the issues you've had and what your experiences are. And I'm open to questions during the course of the kind of introduction part of the presentation, if there's anything you want to throw in. So, how many of you have been playing with digital TV? Yeah, play. How many of you actually have it working? Oh, how many are still a bit worried about how much of it's working? Yeah. Uh, geographically, how many of you are Australian? Okay, New Zealand, American, uh, anywhere in Europe, South America. Ooh, we're quite a restricted little group. Well, that kind of kills about a third of my presentation about you know various world digital formats. So what we're going to talk about, um, focus digital TV on broadcast digital TV. I'm going to talk about what the broadcast standards are and um, also what the audio video standards are in common use at the moment in the digital TV space. Also, we're going to cover how to get it, what the most common hardware is, drivers and software. You know, At the end of the day, we want to be able to watch this stuff, record it, edit it, master it off to DVD, whatever. We'll do a few tips and tricks and some a little bit of debugging of uh, digital TV streams, and we'll try and cover off some of the issues people may have had to date. What we're not going to talk about are analog capture cards. Uh, tough shit. That's old news. Uh, commercial solutions. You have a TiVo. Lucky you. That's very nice. And pay TV is, um, as we are being recorded, strictly off limits. Please catch me over a beer later. But why digital? What's the big deal? Far more flexible and efficient. Rah, 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 better quality picture. Yeah, right. Depends where you live in the world. Uh, HD capable. And um, the media companies like it uh, because it's much easier for them to encrypt. The pay TV companies love digital. And in our case, providing it's free to air, it's much easier to capture. We just capture the raw data. No screwing around with MPEG-2 capture cards or anything else. And we thought analog was a mess. Uh, digital standards around the world have got a little fragmented. Uh, a lot of blue. Uh, DVB is extremely popular. Uh, Japan kind of went off on its own. America has its own. And then things get really messy in South America. So the most common format globally is DVB, digital video broadcasting. Numerous variants thereof to suit most broadcast platforms. And some emerging standards as well that are slowly appearing in, in some markets or in the process of being ratified. ATSC for the Americans amongst us. Uh, also, I'm afraid the poor Canadians had it inflicted upon them. Primarily focused on terrestrial, but it's also used in cable. ISDB for uh, Japan, and for some reason Brazil took the standard on some strange promise from Japanese equipment makers that they would ship them lots of cheap set-top boxes, and then proceeded to modify it slightly. I was trying to be polite. And then China went off and decided to make its own version of DVB. Uh, an awful lot of DVB hardware is effectively DMB capable if you actually look under the hood. So that's the, what the broadcasting are. But what are they actually broadcasting over digital? Again, we hit a lot of country and region specific differences, whether they're doing standard definition, high definition, variants thereof. Um, for a while, Fox in the States considered 480p high definition, I believe. Uh, most common still is MPEG-2 video, but we're start starting to see a real shift towards H.264. MP2 and AC3 were very dominant in the audio space, but we're starting to see HEAAC or other AAC variants in the audio space. So again, far more efficient use of the uh, broadcast capacity. So not only were we seeing more channels in uh, what was formerly an analog channel, we're now seeing even more through better compression and better use of the capacity. So how do you get it? Well, 
To begin with, make sure you know what you're starting with. What is your hardware? What is your OS variant, Linux variant? And what's your tuner? Be very, very careful. Don't just go out there and buy a tuner and then get on the mailing list and go, hey, why doesn't this work? Um, because lots of fun things happen. Uh, manufacturers suddenly change hardware halfway through production uh, in some quite radical ways. So um, there's a very common uh, DVBS satellite capture car from Technotrend. Uh, revision 26, rock solid. Revision 27, slightly flaky. Revision 28, um, took about three years to iron out all the issues with. So you've got to be very careful. Ask around. It will save you a lot of pain. It might be worth you spending an extra 10 or $15 on a card for a lot less aggro. And then make sure you know what your local broadcast standards are. And where do you want to be? What do you want to do? Do you want to watch it live, ad hoc? Do you want to set up your PVR running Myth TV. What are your real aims for uh, getting digital TV? Keeping the wife happy because she gets Coronation Street. Uh, hardware classes, uh, PCI, USB, extremely common. Uh, in the US, there's been a number of uh, ways of getting digital TV with a firewire that are slightly less popular in this part of the world. PCIe is where all the sexy stuff's happening. And there's a few issues. Some of the PCI devices are actually USB. Hey, why didn't that occur to me? They're actually just a um, PCI USB bridge chip and then two USB tuners. If you go and get uh, so the Haupage Nova T500, which is a nice dual DVB-T card, it's actually two USB tuners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, we, we're in a fun world of pain here. It's really good. And PCIe uh, is generally bleeding edge. There are a few cards, particularly in the Australian market, they have got working. Some of the really sexy ones, the one I want most, the Haupage HVR2200. Um, really, I should try and bung Stephen Toth some money to work on it because, oh, it would be so nice. But for Linux, we're all DVB. At the end of the day, it's the DVB project that's written the drivers. And, they, and there's a lot of work underway there to have this layer that effectively talks to ATSC, uh, DMB. It doesn't really matter under the hood to a large extent. It's just, so when you start looking around, if you're looking at other standards, just look at the DVB project. Or now it's the Linux media project. So where do we get them? LinuxTV.org is the place to go looking. But with any luck, your distro has reasonably up-to-date current drivers. Um, it may be worth you just revving to the latest release from Fedora, Ubuntu, whoever, and a lot of your pain will go away. Most of the stuff in kernel is pretty stable. But we do have a few things that you may have to go to the video for Linux uh, Mercurial repository. It's still in Mercurial, isn't it? I think. And then there's the out of tree stuff. Um, a number of vendors now started to ship some hardware with their own drivers slightly forked from the DVB project sources. Or you may have the pleasure of trying to build the EM28XX family of drivers, which, if anyone has actually followed uh, the driver development, in, depending on whose side of the story you take, They've been a thorn in each other's side for a number of years. There's, there's considerable work underway to try and merge the M28XX um, drivers back into the mainstream because they're using a hell of a lot of USB tuners. And they're pretty good. Yeah, afraid we're back to binary firmware blobs. I'm really sorry. Uh, some of them will ship with your distro. Uh, sometimes you've just got to go and pull them out the Windows driver. How posh, got, how posh, how park, depending on your country. I've got really good now that have allowed redistribution and of their binary blobs that are required. So a lot of the cards are pretty damn dumb because they're actually designed for multiple geos. So you need the right firmware. But for the most part, um, the DVB drivers take a lot of that pain away. As long as you've got the firmware in the right place, it will mostly work. 
Great, so we've got the car, we think we've got the firmware, what do we do with it now? Well, first of all, you've got to find some TV channels. Uh, if you're lucky in some parts of the world, uh, some may, well, may have a pre-made channel list, but generally you need to use one of the, the channel scanners. Now, depending on your distro, it's either called DVB scan or scan. Um, that generally takes an input that contains some hints as to where to tune, and it's capable of tuning across DVB-S, DVB-T, across multiple um, broadcast types. A really useful tool to look at, and I'll hopefully demo it, is WSCAN, which is a terrestrial wild scanner. You just point it at a terrestrial tuner, and it will look through all possible um, frequency tables and attempt to find your terrestrial digital channels. So it's great if in your area no one's produced a lookup table or um, your local broadcasters have suddenly decided to move their uh, channels around. So you've got your, cha your, your scan table, you now need to tune in. Um, DVB tune, SAP, TZAP, SAP for satellite, TZAP for terrestrial. I mean, you can lock into a particular channel or transponder or multiplex. And then if we actually want to probe deep inside and see what's going on and see what lies our broadcasters are telling us about their uh, high quality media, uh, DVB snoops really go. You can go in and look at the streams, see what the bit rates are, see what the audio types are, and uh, probe even deeper, uh, as hopefully we can show later. So great, we've got it tuned in. We need to do something with it. The basic things to play with first, if you want to try and capture it, things like M players, really good. You can tune to a, a DVB channel and just dump the stream. Or you've got DVB stream where you can grab the whole of a digital stream or just parts thereof. You're probably going to want to, at the end of the day, use it in some sort of PVR application. And most things like Myth TV support DVB, have done on an ATSC and so forth for a long time. VDRs, particularly popular in some parts of Europe. Oh, you might just want some it's simple TV centric. There's a couple of nice little tools out there if you just want some digital TV on your desktop live. You know, some of the v PVR centric tools like Myth, a regular complaint is, I want to use Myth to watch live TV. Why? It's a PVR. You don't watch it live. You know, oh, the channel changing changing's really slow. You know, well, it is kind of caching you know, a second or two to disk. If you really want live TV, don't use Myth. If you're really fussy about your channel changing, don't use Myth. If you really want fast channel changing, don't use digital TV. It's usually slower than analog, mostly. You got it now on your hard drive. You want to play it back. You name it these days, everything pretty much supports it under Linux. There are very few of the main media players who don't support the, the DVB uh, transmission files. Um, there may be a few codec issues, which we'll cover in troubleshooting. You want to go and do something useful with it, you want to edit it, take the adverts out, save it to DVD. Um, there's a few tools. Myth has its own on-screen editor, which is quite useful. If you want to do anything clever with it, Put the file through Project X first. Anyone played with Project X? Uh, one issue with DVB is uh, they typically use what's called a TS format, transmission stream. When you watch a file off your uh, DVD player, it is a program stream and it has well-defined beginnings and endings and sync points. Transmission stream is designed for an ongoing broadcast and some of the headers are a little bit different, and sometimes some of the editing tools have issues with audio synchronization. Project X is great. It'll go through, sort out the sync, notice bad frames, bad audio frames, bad video frames, do a whole load of fix-ups, and give you a file that in theory may be DVD authorable if it's an MPEG-2, or at least editable. So we've got some video going on. We can edit it, but we want to know what's actually being shown. And as has been mentioned earlier, there's always fun and games over uh, electronic program guide information. And in a lot of countries, you've now got over-the-air EPG data. Um, DVB kind of supposed to require now and next as a bare minimum. And up until now, most channels in Australia have 
provided now and next and a limited bit of other data and the quality is variable. That's the right term. UK, uh, when they went to the Freeview service, pretty much straight away provided seven days of reasonable quality EIT data. Freeview Australia is looking at planning, providing seven days, but again, some of that may be in the hands of the broadcaster. So yes, you're, we may have a few for... The EPG. Yeah, but um, uh, we had a similar issue in New Zealand. Um, TV New Zealand charges an awful lot for access to its program guide data, but they're pr extremely happy to provide it seven days in the clear of a free view satellite. The terrestrial service in New Zealand, for some reason, they decided to provide it in MHEG only, which is an interactive service, so you don't actually get true EIT data. When it works, it's great, because uh, your box can be disconnected from the net and you've still got your EIT data. And also, there's some very clever stuff that's happened in the UK and is being rolled out in New Zealand around an extension called TV Anytime. So as well as the program name, you can embed unique identifiers for a program, a series, or season, and an episode. So you can uniquely, uniquely identify each showing and uniquely identify a show and a season of a show. So you can do series linking and all that other clever stuff over the EIT data. So it would be lovely if we happen to see some of that happen here. Yeah. This is an example of how MYTH renders New Zealand's MHEG EPG. Uh, the UK was one of the first places to roll out MHEG, and New Zealand decided to borrow a lot of the same standards. And there was probably half a dozen code changes and two extra functions had to be dropped into the MYTH MHEG stack. We had full support for New Zealand's MHEG stack the day Freeview launched. Thanks to Freeview New Zealand, they actually supplied us with the specs to help do that, which was very cool. But then we've also got interactive services. Now a lot of people go, oh, I'm not that bothered, but they're what a lot of people expect from their set-top boxes. In the UK, Ireland has mandated it for their new service. Freeview New Zealand, Hong Kong, and Singapore are looking at MHEG as well. That's the dominant format. MHP is a kind of a, uh, MHEG's kind of like a pseudo XML HTML structure, but short form, it's a bit odd. MHP's Java based. Um, the only serious deployments are initially in Korea, but uh, they trialed it here, and then does it go away, or what happened? And a number of other countries have been playing around with it. It's lovely watching the bomb fight that goes on between the two technology groups. And open TV is pretty much what most of the pay companies tend to use for a lot of their interactive services. A uh, fun bit the BBC in the UK have, if you have a look at their technology blog, is they try and provide the same features over all three, because their services are delivered via Sky, they're provided over some of the um, cable companies that may actually use MHP or Open TV, and they do the Freeview service. So they're trying to provide the same interactive features over three different interactive standards. And there's two MHEG 5 stacks for Linux. One is in Myth, and one is called Red Button, which is a standalone stack. So country by country, well, we've got a few US uh, attendees, mostly mix of HD and SD, MPEG-2 video, AC3 is the dominant audio. For some reason, most SD services are only 4 by 3 You only tend to see HD in 16 by 9 and of course, providing Obama doesn't change everything, the analog switch off is only a month or so away. Here, you have your terrestrial service. A mix of HD and SD, which means you kind of went and used up all your bandwidth in one go. Lovely, very good. 
Um, the EIT is currently a little bit limited. You have this fun thing of it all suddenly being rebranded as Freeview AU because it never got the uh, penetration that they expected. And most markets will suddenly get 15 digital channels. Um, yeah, but there will be 15 channels. What they carry is, yeah, a total of 15. In some parts of Australia, you also have a satellite service, uh, Optus Aurora, or there's some other limited satellite services. There's a push underway. I believe there's a couple of online petitions that Freeview Australia should go completely free to wear on satellite in the same model that it is in New Zealand. We'll see what happens with that. UK. Freeview UK has been around for quite, quite a number of years now, and it's hence the adopted model in a lot of other countries. Uh, standard definition, 4x3 or 16x9. Recently, FreeSat launched in the UK um, to try and do some similar infill things that we've got a problem with in New Zealand. You know, not everybody can get Freeview, and they're gonna, they've actually started their analog switch off in some regions. Uh, FreeSat, though, has allowed for H.264 for high-definition video. Uh, there is some work underway to look at introducing H.264 into Freeview Terrestrial. And where I am, we went the other way around. We started with satellite first, because we're a bit odd. Um, MPEG-2, 4x3, 16x9. We sort of feel like the UK model, but to, uh, satellite. And then they launched a service called Freeview HD, only H.264 video, regardless of whether it's standard def or high def. No MP2 audio, it's all HEAC or AC3. MHEG only EPG, there's no EIT data. Um, there's some patches for Myth TV to make some of it work, but the quality is a little variable and we're still working through niggles. So the big trends, of course, we're seeing analog switch off happening in a lot of parts of the world. Um, either currently or planned. A growing shift to H.264, which is going to impact all of you with nice little low power uh, front ends that currently can't handle H.264. In general, better quality picture. I mean, in New Zealand, we're just seeing between 8 and 10 megabit for H.264, rather than a similar bit rate for MP2, MPEG-2 video. So the picture quality is quite high. And pay TV is also switching to H.264 as well, because, of course, they can squeeze more services in. And some interesting new broadcast standards, a shift for satellite to DVB-S2, and the, D the BBC playing with DVB-T2 in the UK to try and squeeze every last ounce of the broadcast space out. So you want to make it work, talk to your friends, get on the forums, make sure you know what you're dealing with, and make sure you know which version of the hardware you're dealing with. If you're going to go and get a card, find a, a, a retailer you know well, and we'll actually take it out of the box and check the revision, because they may have just revved it while in the last month, and suddenly you've got one that's going to be months away from having full support. Yeah, so I've been there. Um, I tend to travel with one of these Haupage HVR900. You don't want the 900H. It's very hard to tell which one you've got. And there's a couple of versions of the 900. This is dual analog digital terrestrial tuner. And it's great for on the road. But yeah, there's a few people recently showed up on the list who've ended up with the 900H in New Zealand because it's the only one you can get now. Um, visual inspection, if it's a PCI, PCIe card, read off the chips. Go to the wiki, check what chips are working. And then if you're lucky, it's plug and play. You just plug it in, the firmware loads, and everything's good. Yeah, that happens a lot. Not. Um, then, go a little bit further. When you actually plug it in, double check. You have your favorite tools, LSPCI, LSUSB, and look at the D message output when you actually plug the device in. Right, this is on 
my myth box in New Zealand, my live one, uh, because it's quite a good div box because it's actually got a PCI card and a USB tuner on the same box. So if I do LS, LS PCI, um, down at the bottom are two devices associated with the uh, tuner card that's in it. Uh, the Technosat Skystar DVB cards are pretty rock solid until they went and changed all the chips. Uh, <laughs> so this is one of the, the earlier revisions where everything just worked pretty cleanly. And the, uh, some of the DVB-S cards actually show up as network devices as well because you can actually do Ethernet over DVB-S and fun stuff. If any of you see, don't know whether you had any of those... Um, split um, uh, broadband services so that your inbound path was, say, via satellite and your return path was via a dial-up modem. There was a bunch of ISPs in New Zealand who ran those services for a while and used similar cards to this, so they just set themselves up as a devi uh, network device. Yeah. yeah. So this one's capable of it. Don't, don't ever touch it. Don't need it. So the main thing is the second to last entry, the video controller, it's uh, IVTC 16, blah, 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 and it's extremely well supported and it's a pretty good device. Um, I'm trying to remember which one it is. Um, the box actually runs quite an old uh, Debian-based distro, and so some of the pieces, uh, the lookup tables aren't completely up to date. One of those is actually a Freecom uh, di single DVB-T USB tuner from the UK. I think it's the top one. And again, when I first got that device and plugged it in, I simply did a search on the USB IDs, immediately I had a couple of mailing list entries, they told me what I needed to do to get it working. I've had that thing working now for about three and a half years under Linux without any issues. It's a, it's a great little tuner, it's DVB-T only. Because um, uh, for a while in New Zealand, where, before they launched the terrestrial service, they actually did all the testing in MPEG-2. So that just worked, so that was really good. Now this is my local box, and what I'm going to do right now is actually plug in the tuner card, the USB one I've got with me, and suddenly, woo, lots of things happen, and we'll scroll back on that in a moment. So again, this tells us a lot about what's going on. Now, because I have the firmware already installed, it does actually load up correctly. But you'll see it's an EM28XX device, and it's got all the EEPROM settings. But there's a lot more to it. Very few of these devices show up as a single kernel module. You'll see one for the tuner, one for the DVB chipset, possibly one for an analog chipset, uh, one for audio. You'll see a whole load of modules load just for a single device. So even down here, it, it loads the TV EEPROM driver so it can send the firmware through. And there's it finding the actual firmware file. And it says, whoa, loading 80 firmware images. And then for some reason, it defaults to loading an MTS something or another, uh, probably not going to work in this part of the world. The moment I tell it to tune in, it changes the entry in that firmware table to one that's Australian compatible or New Zealand compatible. Some of those firmware files have got um, uh, different kind of stubs for different countries. Um, yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, one big gotcha when you're trying to play with some of these devices is you may have in kernel a version of a module for one of these components that doesn't quite work on the revision that you've got. And so if you are going to build 
the DVB code from source, you need to make sure you clean up the ones that conflict. For a while, the EM28XX project actually provided uh, packages for Ubuntu Hardy. And you would install them, and only certain features would work unless you went around and removed the conflicting packages out of your kernel directories. And then it worked really well, pretty clean. We're, this is actually running uh, Ubuntu 8.10, and this card actually just worked out the box on 8.10. First time ever that this particular tuner just worked with nothing, having it to install anything other than the firmware blob to make it work, which is pretty cool. Oops, back. Right, so the tuner's in. We notionally think it's going to work because the firmware actually loaded and we can see it. So now we actually need to try and find some channels. Now, sadly, it doesn't appear I have a TV aerial in this room. So uh, this isn't a canned demo. I'm actually doing it live against two boxes running in New Zealand. So, but a number of the issues I hit there are the kind of things you're going to hear here anyway. So, we'll just show you what's going on. So, where are we? Yeah, I actually have some Australian sample files with me. So we're doing a bit of Q&A about some of the issues you're going to hit. I can give you some examples for Australia. So this is using the scan tool, which needs a hint of what to scan. In this case, uh, DVB adapter zero is a satellite adapter. And I've got a config file for Freeview on Optus D1 that provides a hint of where the channels are. If you, anyone here play with satellite? Yeah, when you're playing with satellite, you need to know a little bit more. Like, you need to know some stuff about your satellite dish. What the there's an LMB on your satellite. You need to know how it's set up in order to do some of these scans. Um, a lot of that is put this way. If you're playing with satellite, you'll discover this stuff quite quite quickly. So this is doing a live scan against Optus D1, which provides all our services into Australia and New Zealand. And all I can pick up at the moment are the two transponders that are in use for the New Zealand channels. So the first thing it did was uh, just some generic output about the channels. And then it here, I'll move the screen across. Ooh, dear. It would have been nice to have. Okay, at the bottom here, it's done a dump of the channel information in a form that mPlayer understands and Zinni understands. You can also output it in forms that are compatible with VDR and some of the other tools. Uh, this basically tells me the channel name as advertised by the broadcaster. Second number is the, um, uh, the frequency it's broadcasting on in a satellite form, in this case. Uh, the polarity, because the satellite's horizontal and vertical polarity some other information. The last three numbers are the, the really important ones because the way DVB is organized, you've got multiple streams and a single signal. So you need to know the identifiers for those streams. So you've got the video identifier, audio identifier, and the pro channel identifier. And depending on the software, it'll use a combination of those in order to tune in and actually pull out the raw video and audio data. Some cases, some channels may advertise multiple Audio streams, uh, channels may have additional metadata like teletext or subtitle information also associated with their channel identifier down here. So this is what we can currently see in New Zealand. Most of them have same channel names. This, these two are actually firmwares for the official set-top boxes. So if you know what you're doing with the right debug tools, you can actually pull down the firmware blob out of the over-the-air stream. Uh, down towards the bottom, we've got a couple of audio-only channels, including one which doesn't have a real name because it's not actually part of Freeview. 
Uh, it's actually Nui FM, and they paid the broadcaster that runs the satellite some money to put the channel up, but they won't pay the fee to join Freeview. <laughs> so, yeah. And then we've got some reserved and hidden channels that occasionally come on and off. So that's what I can currently see in New Zealand for uh, satellite. Um, let's find the right screen. It varies from distro to distro. It Scan is either a member of DVB-utils or DVB-utils or DVB-tools or there's a number of variants that seems to vary from distro to distro. And sometimes it's called Scan and sometimes it's called DVB-scan. Great, guys. Now, this box has terrestrial tuner. And I've found with terrestrial devices, the minus U5 says wait five times as long. Because occasionally, um, the, the metadata that it uses to scan for the channels gets repeated regularly. But sometimes it doesn't get repeated regularly enough, and it's worth actually putting that extra uh, timeout in, extending the timeout. The minus U says um, if you find embedded channel numbers, return them in the standard format. Uh, any of you heard of a thing called LCN? Logical Channel number like Numbering. Um, it basically, it means that the set-top boxes can be told what order the channels are really in. So this is doing a live terrestrial sc scan of the New Zealand service. And we've got three multiplexes active. Now it'll go off and scan a whole load of other stuff because, which I'll quit, and I'll scroll back up so we can see what happened. Now in Australia, the DVB tools ship with files from most major cities, so you can simply find the file that say Hobart, Australia. You throw that at DVB at, at scan, and you will scan the channel frequencies for here. Uh, I did that last night in the hotel, uh, night before. For New Zealand and some other countries, what you can actually do within the DVB data is say what the other transmission frequencies are. So if I left this running, it would go and go through all the transmission sites in New Zealand just in case they're broadcasting in Auckland, which is not too clever. Again, they screwed that up a little bit. So in our case, we've got our first multiplex has five channels from TVNZ. Second channel is owned by MediaWorks, who only have two channels active. And then we have Cordia, who are the broadcaster, manage the last channel for a whole load of other broadcasters. Um, so we've got a mix of radio and TV in there, including a bunch of test and hidden channels. And that's one of the cool things you play with these toys. You can start finding channels you wouldn't otherwise see. Uh, the test channel there shows a whole load of rural rugby on Saturday afternoons because they use it to test the OB gear. Uh, occasionally, one of the reserve channels they use for testing a new broadcaster before they actually join the service. So for a week or two, you might get another broadcaster who then decides don't want to join Freeview, but they don't appear on the official set-top boxes. So again, now, here, because we're dealing with terrestrial, when it actually dumps the channel data, it's a bit too big for the screen, there's a whole load more info in there. Again, we've got channel name, frequency. Then we get a whole load of terrestrial tuning information, which mostly you can ignore unless you really want to start digging around in the protocols. And then again, we've got the three numbers at the end, video, audio, and actual channel identifier. If I would use the off-the-shelf version of SCAN, I wouldn't have any entries here, because the off-the-shelf version up until recently, didn't have the support for HEAC audio or H264 video. So they're just showing up as zeros. So 
I put the patches back into the DVB tools and into WSCAN so they understand um, those settings now. One other problem you've got is if a TV channel is transmitting multiple audio streams, how do you know which one you want? So you can actually run the tool in a uber verbose mode. And now it starts telling you that like TV3 here, there's the video PID, there's the audio PID, and it also has an AC3 PID. So it's got multiple audio streams associated with that channel. So we can listen to it in, in stereo, or we can go and get the 5.1 audio. And we can choose then which one we want to actually listen to. That's quite useful here in Australia because uh, some of the channels are doing multiple streams, and generally these tools will default to MP2. Um, if you're doing satellite stuff and you want to avoid a lot of aggro gun, borrow a set, set top box and make sure your dish is pointing in the right direction and all that other good stuff, <laughs> then it might just work. Uh, I have a, what they call a toroidal, it's a multi-focus dish. I can get uh, seven birds on it. Or, and believe me, trying to get that set up without using a set top box, just using a tuner card, no, no, life's too short. W scan. Um, uh, this may take some time. It will just go through the full terrestrial tune in space. So if you're missing some channels, grab W scan. I've got the link in the presentation. It's great. It just keeps going and it will find all the frequency blocks in use where you are. It's quite good for te finding like rogue additional. Uh, transmission sites and testing and stuff that other people may not have logged yet. When you're testing it, well, tuned it in, or I've got a tuning table now thanks to the scan. It's compatible with Empire. I tend to go to Empire straight away. Uh, I know a lot of people deride it, but it tells me lots of things, including when things go wrong. And it's really easy to do DVB testing with. And as long as you're using reasonably recent build off SVN. It works with pretty much every codec out there. It was invaluable for testing Freeview HD. It works well over here with uh, your terrestrial service. You may hit some fun performance issues uh, dependent on your hardware with HD streams, particularly if you're playing with H.264, which comes to performance. MPEG-2 for the most part is a given, it tends to work, and there's some ways to do some acceleration. H.264, unless they use what they call slice-based encoding, FFmpeg, which most of the products use for decoding, doesn't uh, thread across multiple cores. So you just need a really fast processor. If I want to watch TV3 stream, which is 1080i, H.264 between 10 and 12 megabits, I'm running it on an Athlon X2600, as soon as I start the stream, the core goes flat tack, the fans go flat tack, the heat goes through the roof. It's like living in a wind turbine. Now, there's some cool shit going on, some of which has been talked about here. Um, everyone, most people know about XVMC, been around for a long time, provides support for accelerating MPEG-2. NVIDIA changed the game recently with VDPAU, which is like, <coughs> and suddenly everyone else is playing catch-up, which is awesome. VDPAU will accelerate MPEG-2, H.264, and VC1 on Linux. It's not exactly stable, but it's pretty cool. And if anyone wants to look up something sexy, look up the NVIDIA ION, which is their new Atom-based platform. VAAPI is Intel's attempt, and XVBA is ATI slash um, AMD's attempt. Um, I think pretty much everyone's playing catch up at the moment with NVIDIA in that space. But this is good. We have some real movement going on. Analysis. Well, if you really want to get to down and dirty with what's going on, there's a lot more in your DVB data than just the audio and video streams. You've got teletext information. You may have subtitle information. It would be cool to record a show, suck down the subtitle metadata, and have it go as subs on the DVD you're burning. be cool. Um, you've also got over-the-air EPG data, interactive services, 
potentially other data services. Uh, in the UK, there's chunks of the DVB spectrum that's used commercially for data services. So use DVB Snoop. It's great. So you can do a PID scan. So you can lock to a transponder, lock to a multiplex, and see what PIDs are active. And the PIDs are the way of identifying each data stream. You can do a signal strength check, and you can actually um, decode individual PIDs. Certain PIDs tend to have a certain structure, so you can probe inside and look at the channel information, look at what audio and video um, codecs those channels may be using, what bandwidth uh, those channels are requesting from the DVB multiplex, so you can know what the maximum bit rate to expect. There's a whole load of metadata in there. So the PIDs, the core one first is zero. That should always be there. Unless you're trying to lock onto a service like Imparja, who like to hide their tr satellite services, and they don't provide a whole load of this data. They kind of try and hide the channels. But thanks to DVB Snoop, you can actually find all the hidden channels that you wouldn't otherwise be able to tune into. So PAT is the first thing, identifies the core of your channel information. Network table identifies a whole bunch of channels that are part of a broadcast network. The BAT then provides things like channel name and logical channel number. EIT table for our over the air EPG. And then there's these PMT tables, which are one per channel, which maps. So earlier, the last number at the end would have related to the PMT table, and that will tell you what the, well, actually it doesn't, sorry. If you actually look at the relationship, it's kind of, some fun circular dependencies happen within the DVB metadata. But at the end of the day, um, most of the tools like DVB Scan and Myth TV do a reasonable job of handling it. Oops, so we'll try and run Snoop, though it's behaving badly earlier. Okay. My wife appears to be watching TV at the moment, so I can't tune it in. Um, what I've done on my boxes, because I'm always monitoring what um, broadcasters are up to, is I have a couple of shell script wrappers I run regularly, and they pull down all the metadata for me. So I actually show you some I've got captured. And I actually keep it all stored in, in subversion. So when it changes, like the change, the bit rates on channels or channel names or audio pits and everything, I can tell what's changed over time, which for when you're really playing around this stuff, it's actually quite useful. So what I've got here, this is for the satellite service. So I've got two sets of data, transponder one and transponder two. And for each of those, I've got the PAT table, the NIT table, the SDT stroke BAT table, and all the PMT entries. So. So this is the network table. And what's really neat, especially in the satellite space, it does things like, um, where are we? Like the name of the network. It tells you what satellite you're on. That's actually embedded in there. And with some of the pay services like Sky in New Zealand, their backup service uses a different satellite. So their network table actually contains entries for this satellite and entries for another satellite that's their backup on the same network table. And you can actually find out all the correct tune-in tune frequencies. Then we start to see that on this particular transponder, 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, we've got the following channels and how they're identified. And not all those channels may be visible on your official set-top box. Some of them may be data. Some of them may not actually be live yet, may just be marked as hidden. 
and there's the other transponder that they use and all of its services. And then these tables tend to repeat a lot. Skies tends to repeat in different forms. Um, Sky New Zealand does something funny. They have the card they give the customer plugs into one channel set. The, the card they give to their employees plugs into a slightly different one. Um, if you want to know why, I'll tell you when the camera isn't on. This is the PAT table. So it says, okay, uh, 1922 maps onto PID 268. So if we pull down PID 268, it'll give us the audio, video information for program channel 1922 and also any other metadata associated with it potentially, whether it's encrypted, what its bit rates are, and so forth. And this is one, um, this is the PMT table. No, I don't want that one. Next. Yeah, so here's one of those channel tables. So this is, here we go. There's the audio data. And that means that th this means it's an MP2 audio stream. And then there's the, that's um, stream type 11. That's actually carousel information actually carries the interactive service. So it says that this channel has an interactive service associated with it. So I managed to skip the videos. Oh, no, that one is just a radio channel. Whereas this one actually has video, and that's marked as MPEG-2 video. So there's video, teletext, so it has some subtitles and teletext. And again, it has that additional carrier for interactive services. If anyone wants to see some of this going on live, uh, catch me later when hopefully no one at home is actually watching anything. Or I can find a, an, an aerial and I can actually plug this device in and do some live debugging on Australia. So the end game is we want it just to work. We want it to work on Myth. We want it to work whatever our tools are. And so you're probably going to want a few of these links because it's worth playing before you go anywhere near Myth Scanner. Because trust me, if you're trying to tune in with Myth's terrestrial scanner, you're going to hit a number of fun bugs, unless they're fixed in 22. If you, um, uh, the biggest one I hit in New Zealand is if I do a terrestrial scan. Most of the metadata entries in the DVB table are zero. Um, it's somehow, because of this extended lookup that New Zealand provides and giving us all the frequencies for all the transmission sites, it seems to go through and overwrite a whole load of the um, scan entries when you do a manual DVB-T scan. So what I tend to do is use WScan or DVB-Scan to find out the real entries, and then I scan each one uniquely rather than let it scan a whole bunch of multiplexers. It's a real pain. Well, if, it's, if you want to play with it M-Player, you put it in home.mplayer or home.zinni and it will tend to work or you can actually import it into myth yeah yeah I had it work and then I had it fail and I had it work again um, another thing worth doing is having PHP my admin set up and know which data tables to look at and and st have a look at the DVB entries in the database because occasionally they need to go in and be plugged. For the PVR product we were shipping in New Zealand whenever we wanted to update the channels we just had the script went through and rewrote parts of the database tables just so everything worked. Paul?
Mm. We've had a bit of that in New Zealand with official set-top boxes and our terrestrial service. And it's check your aerial, check your cables. All it takes is a few bad bits, uh, some bad weather, um, some trees waving around in the case of satellite services. And all of a sudden, you may not be seeing any bit, uh, BER or other issues. And your signal seems quite strong, but you're still getting corruption through. I was over in the UK a few months ago, and uh, my dad's place, the aerial they've got on the loft, has extremely good signal. And yet, a whole load of things I captured had some serious corruption. Yeah, that's another one. You really got to watch signal boosters as well with digital. You can over boost the signal and then it just gets really messy. If you're playing around in Australia, odds on a lot of the channel scanners won't automatically find the AC3 audio. Like you'll end up with the channels.com file with some empty entries or you won't get the AC3 audio. That's where scan minus V is good or VV, because you'll actually see where, what the audio PIDs are and you can add them in manually. But it's a real shame, I mean, I was hoping that they'd use the opportunity with Freeview Australia to kind of rip up the game book and do something sexy, but it looks like you're, you're going to be stuck with MPEG-2 for quite a while. We managed it in New Zealand. <laughs> Anyone else? I'm, I'm over time, probably, aren't I? Am I good? Just on. So, anyone wants to see any other demos, give us a yell. I'll have the gear with me all week. So, thank you.